Good morning, good morning, and welcome to the International Mastermind Association Thinking Grow Rich show. My name is Galen Bingham. I am the leadership strategist, and I am just excited to be back with you guys again this morning. And if you are new to this show, or if you are here for the third time, right, and you've only done this a couple of times, boy, do we have a treat for you today. Uh, we're going to be, number one, we're going to be talking about uh, organized planning, which is the sixth step to, risk, or to riches. It's the crystallization of desire into action. Uh, not only are we going to be talking about this principle, but we have an amazing guest with us today, Mr. Wyman Winbush, and he is no stranger to the show. If you guys have ever experienced Wyman, you know that you need to have a pad of paper and a pen with you or you need to have a fresh space on the notes part of your of your computer because he is the wisdom broker and I don't I don't even know if he can control it just every moment you never can tell tell when there might be a, a nugget of wisdom that he drops so we are excited to have him with us today so um, and then also we're gonna be talking like I said we're going to be talking about uh, really, I believe, the, the engine behind this thinking or rich process, and that is organized planning. A lot of people talk about things that they want to have someday uh, and the difference between someday and 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 today is your ability to have organized planning. So definitely make sure that you are um, tracking along with what we have. Uh, in store with you today. We got a lot of people already in the chat. Good morning, Doretha, Dennis. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Definitely tell your friends. Send this link to friends because surely you know someone who needs to be a part of this conversation. Uh, and you would be something less than a friend if you kept all this wisdom to yourself. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, our guest. Uh, before I bring him on, our Wyman Winbush is a graduate of the Naval Academy. Uh, he's an uh, MBA from Jacksonville University, and he has spent 30 years plus working with IBM in sales and sales management. Uh, he has spent uh, 30 years uh, where he retired from the Naval Reserves as a captain, uh, 30 years of total service. Uh, he's got over 30 years of marriage, and um, that's where all this wisdom comes from, right? You see 30 years. This isn't something that he's done for a few years or read a couple of books. This guy is absolutely the real thing. So like I said, no stranger to the show, and uh, if you've got – uh, I'm gonna. I'm trying to stall to give you a few minutes to make sure you've got something uh, to write with because this is going to be amazing. Uh, I see Angelina has joined us. Good morning to you. I see Jason Murray, Murray has joined us. Good morning to you, Sharice uh, Dubose. Thank you so much for joining. And um, one of the things that uh, I really want us to get into, and I, uh, after this, I'll bring in Wyman. Uh, but one of the things I want to get into, if you if you watched us or listened to us last week, uh, we talked about uh, the the major attributes of of leadership. Uh, but today, uh, because we've got the wisdom broker, uh, I'm hoping that we're going to get into the ten major causes of failure in leadership, uh, because leadership really is the the seat of all learning and the seat of all success. Uh, I have never ever. Uh, experienced anyone or personally have gone into a situation where uh, things worked out incredibly well, it was easy, and uh, you know we set new records, and then I've taken a step back and said, well, let me take a look at what happened. You know, What are the principles that led to that success? Uh, I don't ever remember doing that, but I can remember times when things did not go well. I still don't know what I'm going to do the next time, but boy, let's let's take some notes to make sure I don't do this exact same thing again, uh, because uh, there were some lessons in the failure. And the 10 major causes of failure per Napoleon Hill is number one, the inability to organize details. 
That's the number one uh, cause of failure that he lists. Uh, the unwillingness to render humble service. Number three is expecting uh, uh, ex expectation of pay for what they know instead of what they do with what they know. Uh, fear of competition. Uh, fear of competition from from followers. Lack of a lack of imagination. Selfishness is number six. Intemperance is number seven. Disloyalty is number eight. Number nine is emphasis on authority of leadership. So. Um, in emphasis of the authority of leadership and then number 10 is emphasis of title so those are the 10 major attributes or causes of failure due to leadership and um i i can't think of a better person to help us work through those lessons that you get from organized planning but the lessons that you get from leadership than the wisdom broker himself Mr. Wyman Winbush, welcome to the show. Come on, come on in. <laughs> Thank you, Galen, man. I'm so glad to be here. I'm excited uh, for the show I watch on Saturdays when I'm not uh, working, speaking someplace. And I'm just glad to be part of the program today. Well, l like I said, man, you, you are not uh, a stranger to the show. Uh, you've been on a couple of times. We've connected um, uh, a couple of times. I think the the origin of our connection when we first met it was over this book think and grow rich that's right uh, i would love to have you share just a little bit about uh why is this book one of those books that people read over and over again um you know it's 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 one thing to read the book to know what's in it it's another thing to study it and and try to ferret the principles that you get from it why does this book continue to be one of those books that well-read and successful people list as one of their top five favorites of all time? Well, Galen, just just listen to the title. Think and grow rich. How could you not pick that up? And and one of the things I know is, you know, you know baseball season is in full swing. These are some of the highest paid athletes in the world, yet every spring they go to spring training and go over the same fundamentals that they've done since T-ball. Why? Because going over fundamentals and reviewing what got you where you are will keep you where you are. Mm -hmm. And so the reason people pick up this book over and over and over again is because they understand if they read and review the principles they're less likely to forget or bypass or marginalize the principles. And when you apply the principles, they work. They wouldn't pick the book up unless the it worked, the precepts worked. That's why people pick the book up, not just once, not just twice, but they read it over and over again. And, and I heard one good friend of mine say, you know, every time I read the book, I find that the book is reading me. Mm. I don't know who said that, but there's a, there's a wise gentleman there uh, that, that's grinning at me right now that remembers that quote, um, because yes, the book continues to evolve as we evolve. So every time you read it, you pick up new precepts, new principles that were always there, but in your less mature state, you were not prepared to see them, grasp them and apply them. Wow. Wow, man, I, I'll tell you, we, we haven't even gotten into the conversation yet. And uh, I've got like four or five things that uh, we need to write down to make sure that we remember. So um, I'll tell you, let, let's get into the principles, uh, because I want us to under to get a, an understanding as to where this organized planning fits into this overall philosophy. Uh, and then I want to get into this conversation around leadership and the failures from leadership. So let, let's take a listen to this uh, to this video, understand all the principles and where organized planning fits, and then we'll be right back with the Wisdom Broker. Number one is desire. Napoleon Hill said that everything starts with a burning desire, a compelling reason for doing what it is we do. 
Step two is faith, having belief in our ability to attain that which we desire. Step three is what we call auto-suggestion. Auto-suggestion simply means being very intentional about the things that we are pouring into our thoughts, into our brains, and into our consciousness. Our brains, our minds, will receive everything automatically. But we have to work extra hard to make sure that the positive things are what we are feeding ourselves, because those positive thoughts are going to turn into positive actions. Step number four is specialized knowledge. No one person knows everything, even about whatever their particular area of expertise might be. And the value of the mastermind principle is using the specialized knowledge of other people. Step number five is imagination, the workshop of the mind. Everything starts with our imagination and our thoughts, the burning desire to transform those thoughts into our reality. In order to do that, we have to take a look at step six, which is organized planning. That is how we crystallize our desire into action, organizing ourselves. Having the thought and not acting on the thought isn't going to get us anywhere. We have the thought. We go through the organized planning to transform that thought into action. Step number seven is decision. What Napoleon Hill said is the mastery of procrastination. Napoleon Hill said that the antidote to procrastination is simply to make a decision and then move on that decision. Step eight is persistence. We have to have a sustained effort which is induced by our faith in order to achieve our goals. One of Napoleon Hill's books I love, even the title, Three Feet from Gold. Those people who became rich during the gold rush in the wild, wild west days didn't do that because they were necessarily smarter or had better information than anyone else. It's because they stayed just a little bit longer. Sometimes people left when they were just literally three feet from gold. So hanging in there, being persistent, is step number eight. Step number nine, the power of the mastermind, the driving force. None of us can accomplish anything on our own. Everybody, I don't care who you are, from the most prominent person to the person who might be considered the lowest on the totem pole, everybody has someone who helped them get to where they are. And the power of the mastermind is being able to use those influences around us. Use the thoughts. Use the knowledge. Use the exploration of other people to help us in achieving our goal. Step number 10, the mystery of sex transmutation. This title can be a little confusing, but essentially what the mystery of sex transmutation means is that we oftentimes in our society think of sex as being purely physical. It is absolutely physical, but what Napoleon Hill teaches us is that sex also has an emotional element and that sex is the strongest of our desires. That if we can take our sexual energy, transform that into positive, creative influences, it can propel us to new heights. And so we spend quite a bit of time talking about the mystery of step 10, which is sex transmutation. Step number 11 is the subconscious mind, which Napoleon Hill tells us is the connecting leap between our human mind and the infinite intelligence, the source of all thought, the source of all creativity. Conscious mind, we spend some time talking about how we use that through the influence of auto-suggestion and what we're feeding into our mind. Step number 12, which is the brain, the broadcasting and receiving station of thought. Final step number 13, the sixth sense, the door to the temple of wisdom. This is the final step through which infinite intelligence may and will communicate voluntarily without any effort from or demands by the individual. The principle is the apex of the philosophy. It can be assimilated, understood, and applied only by first mastering the other 12 principles. All right, and there you have it. So those are those are the um, the principles of thinking grow rich process. And you see organized planning sits right in the middle. And I love when the video says uh, having an idea and not acting on the idea doesn't do us any good. So many people uh, I have met, and so a lot of my clients actually will have these amazing ideas and they're fearful about taking action 
And that's what organized planning is about. So we're going to get back into this conversation with Wyman Winbush, the wisdom broker. But I just want to acknowledge Jason. Jason Murray, thank you so much for joining from Teaneck, New Jersey. Uh, we've got Renetta Gordon, uh, Imelda Wallace. And uh, yeah, Wyman, don't, don't, don't feel any pressure, but I see Rosemary Winbush there in the chat. So you, you got some, you got some, I don't know, is that, is that your daughter in the chat that's checking in? <laughs> yeah, that, that's, my, that's my bride, my boo of 33 years, man. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, well, you know, normally, normally I could say you could say anything and nobody will catch you, but I think you got some fact checkers in the chat room. So, yes, sir. Let's get into this conversation uh, because, um, again, organized planning, from my standpoint, is the engine behind this process. And as the video said, having an idea and not acting on the idea is is really not worthwhile. It's not going to do anything. Um, and then I introduced uh, also what Napoleon Hill uh, constitutes as the attributes of failure in leadership. And this idea that uh, I've never taken the time to study any of my successes. It's always been my failures that uh, I've spent time breaking down and analyzing and, and trying to figure out what went wrong. And that's been the seed of learning. What's your take on this whole organized planning or any of the things that we talked about already? Well, you know, you heard the old adage, you know, if you um, fail to plan, you plan to fail. Right. Um, when I speak, a lot of times I'll open with uh, everybody take your pens and papers out. Why? Because you'll lose the the thought re regarding what is said and what is learned within 24 hours. You lose 40 percent of it if you don't write it down. Then I follow up Galen by telling them that if it's worth writing down, it's worth taking action on. You can just freeze frame right there. If it's worth writing down, and in other words, there's something in your, even in your subconscious self said, oh, that was a nugget. Let me write that down. There's something within your being, within your ethos, with, with, within your, your yourself that says, wow, this could help me. This is something I need to take action on. If it's worth writing down, it's worth taking action on. And there is the genesis of planning. So I tell people, even now, as you write notes, if you're listening to this, if it's worth writing down, it's worth taking action on. Don't just write down what is said. Write down what you're going to do, action, what you're going to do with what is said. Because knowledge is not power. Writing it down or memorizing something and have it for reference later, is not. there's no power in that. The power comes when you take action on it. It's just like the book, Think and Grow Rich. To know that book cover to cover, know all the principles, precepts, uh, and understand it to the point that even you can teach it, it, it doesn't uh, enhance or enable you to become successful unless you're actually taking action on it. To put, a, to put a nutritious meal in front of you doesn't make you healthy. You've got to eat it, mm. right? So Galen, in my opinion, you know, the genesis of leveraging this principle, organized planning, is, is, is taking action on what you know. That's the first step. And when you take action, it means how do I make this principle or precept work for me? What actions, what steps, who do I need to work as far as a network? How do I make it work for me? That's how you get organized and, and set your priorities up going forward. Does that make sense? It does. It does. It makes a lot of sense. And one of the things that I'm always frustrated by with this book is how uh, he puts these gems in such plain sight. And it takes me so long to find what's been laying in plain sight. Back to your point, the name of this book is not think and rich. That that middle word is grow. That's the action part of it. You've got to grow. If you just think that's not going to make you rich. It's the growth part. That's the engine behind being rich. And when we say rich, a lot of times people think of money. Uh, and while riches does include money, riches also includes your health. It also includes your friendships. It also includes your relationships. It also includes however you define riches. But the key word is grow. 
You've got to be willing to grow. You've got to be willing to do the things that go that you think about rather than just sitting there thinking about it. Again, I was just thinking, you know, it, it certainly transcends monetary wealth. Grow in wisdom. For example, if all you focus on is riches, all you end up with is the ability to find more creative ways to destroy your life. Right. That great philosopher <laughs> Deion Sanders once said, yes, Neon Dion, money doesn't make you better. It just makes you more of who you already are. Mm. Wow. So uh, tell me again, of all the all the education that you've had, all the experiences that you've had, uh, what are some principles from organized planning that you seem to continue to use uh, where you, you, you may have even lost sight of it coming from organized planning, of it coming from this book, but are, are there some principles that have become core to who you are and how you operate? Well, I think one of them is uh, definiteness of purpose and vision are, are tightly coupled. Um, one of the precepts that I, I, I speak to when I'm um, speaking to people just coming to corporate America, I talk about the importance of not majoring in the minor, not majoring in the minor. You see, when you know where you're going, you know why you're going, and you know that the, the purpose for which you, you woke up this morning and you're in pursuit of your destination, whether it be a physical fitness goal, financial goal, business goal, relationship goal, there's many of them. You can't get distracted. And, and sometimes in this world, social media world, it's easy to get distracted if you fall into it. So the social media world, for example, is very focused on who messed up and who's to blame. I give you an example, Galen, you know, there's guys sitting uh, duck hunting. One of them, one of the three discharges their shotgun in the bottom of the boat. That's the wrong time to say who did that. That's majoring in the minor. The major is what do we do, regardless of whose fault it was, what can we do to plug the hole in the boat so we don't drown? And, and I, I see a lot of people, uh, victims of shiny object syndrome, because they don't maintain focus. Uh, they have tremendous capabilities. They can do many things. But just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something, particularly if doing that thing distracts you or takes you away from your primary purpose, goal, or cause, right? So your ability to focus, uh, the ability to um, maintain and focus all your energy on the principal thing and not get distracted by, you know, the things, the uh, chasing a rabbit, if you would, as they used to say. Uh, Galen, does that make sense? Oh my, oh my. Yeah, you know, uh, not only does that make sense, you, you, I think you might be speaking to me and I don't appreciate that very much. Um, you, one of the things I'd love to get you to share a little bit more about is in these, in these, um, list of failures, the third one, the number three is expectation of pay for what they know instead of what they do with what they know. And, you know, the author goes on to say that the world does not pay people, uh, for that, which they know it pays them for what they do. And a lot of times people, and I wish Dr. Peter James were here because he, he loves to talk about this. A lot of people will chase certifications. They will chase degrees and you've got degrees, you've got certifications, but uh, people don't pay you because you have the degrees. They don't pay you because you have the certifications. They pay you because of what you've done with those degrees and certifications and the knowledge. Talk a little bit about, um, uh, experiences that you've seen with people chasing those shiny degrees, those shiny certifications, and and not necessarily being willing to do things with it. Oh, that's great. I've, I've heard Dr. James uh, discuss this before. And man, he, he's, he's uh, we're, we're singing from the same hymn though. Look, when I talk to young people, I know you've got a, uh, a, a daughter that just finished her freshman year at Spelman. Give her a shout out uh, this morning. So she's looking uh, you know, um, you know, uh, congrats on finishing your first year. But I tell people the purpose of college is not to get a degree, which some people are offended by. 
but let me finish. The purpose of college is to acquire a set of skills that maximizes the value you bring to the marketplace in your chosen field or vocation. Don't confuse education with knowledge. Don't confuse getting a degree with know-how. You see, because when you, for example, you and I, Galen, when we come to a client, they don't really care what degrees we have at this point, what we've been able to do over the course of our careers carries much more weight than what degree we have. That's the reason why once you get your first job, nobody asks you what your GPA is. It doesn't matter. The only thing matters that matters is how can your collective experience and education and know-how enhance my ability for my company or me personally to accomplish what I desire to accomplish? That's bringing value to the marketplace. If you have a PhD and you bring no value because you can't articulate your ideas or convert your know-how into in, in being able to enable me to do better or more, you bring no value. Therefore, you don't get paid. And, and, and rather in, in the marketplace, when you bring no value, that's called unemployment. Does that make, I mean, I can't make it any plainer than that. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And the chat, the chat line is, is lighting up a little bit too. Doretha Dennis is uh, saying, take action and says you must do the work. Jason Murray, uh, he says, I can relate as opportunities are always put in front of you. And it's important to stay focused with achieving your goals or project. Uh, opposed, as opposed to taking on new opportunities, staying focused on what's important. Um, that I mean, that's a, really at the core of what we're talking about. How do you how do you first decide? And you mentioned this definite of purpose. How do you decide what's important and then stay focused on what's important? Um, and you know, one of the other principles that he listed as being the cause of failure in leadership is number nine: this emphasis on a authority of leadership where you, you do it because I said so and uh, you've been in the military command and control is a big part of the military and I've, I've had a couple of conversations with some military leaders and they say yeah we'll, we'll do what what our commander tells us because they because he's the commander but we're not going to put our gusto into it right we're not going to look for opportunities to do the extra if that's the only thing that they're leading with is is their leadership position talk a little bit about how important leadership is with uh with this organized planning and which we've said is the growth behind any success well first it just is and i say um, often tongue in cheek, I'm a leadership bigot. What that means is as, as a graduate of a service academy, you know, West Point, Air Force Academy, Naval Academy, Coast Guard Academy, Merchant Marine Academy, et cetera. Their sole purpose is to produce leaders to lead men and women in the profession of arms. In other words, the armed services. So from your freshman year to the time you graduate, and even after you're in the military, you're constantly getting new angles, perspectives on how to maximize your ability to lead. One of the precepts uh, I, I, I embrace as a leader is how do you measure a successful leader? A leader is not measured by the number of people who follow them. A leader's success is measured by how many leaders they produce in their wake. In other words, as you lead, you also teach others to lead. As you tell them to go left or go right, Yes, they'll follow your orders because you are their quote unquote leader. But at some point over the course of time, you teach them why it's prudent that you go left and go right or go right and when. So when you're not there, they will still do it. Not because you're the leader, but because that's the road that leads to success. Uh, one of my uh, favorite books uh, from Good to Great by Jim Collins. Uh, excellent book on leadership. The number one principle that separates clients, companies that experience sustained success from those who fail is leadership. And he calls it level five leadership. Leaders, right? This is one of the precepts uh, uh, in, in the, the 10 major causes of failure about um, humility. 
Level five leaders are extremely competent, extremely passionate. They know their stuff. They know they know their stuff. And they're willing to get up every morning with the sunrise and get it done. And they do the work. But it is coupled with extreme humility. They're the leaders that say we, us, and our are always giving credit to the teams that they lead as opposed to someone who is equally competent, equally passionate, equally willing to do the work that is not humble and they think the world revolves around them. And when you interview them, they use words like me, mine, and I. Look at what I did, right? And so I, I believe that that sense of humility uh, is tightly coupled and inseparable from great leadership, right? And so you come back, organized planning, uh, you know, the African proverb says, right? If you wanna go fast, go by yourself. If you wanna go far, take the village with you. Anytime the village is involved, there's an element of leadership involved. And leaders know how to not only pursue their passion, but they also know how to impart their passion to others so that they will voluntarily get excited uh, to help you go where you're going and celebrate you when you get there and realizing just by hanging out with you, they're further along toward on their journey than they would have had they not met you. Man, I threw a lot out there, Galen. Does, does any of that make sense? Oh my gosh, you, you keep reminding me of something I thought I read somewhere else that says you will know them by their fruits. I don't, I don't know where that came from. Help me with where that came from. I, I, what I that always tell people I'm a fruit inspector, man. <laughs> All right. You'll know the tree by the fruit that it bears. That's it. That's it. Right. And, and so, again, if you want to say is someone a great leader, count the number of people who point to them as being an integral part of their success. Mm. Wow. So so how, how do you use this book? Um, you know, you, you, you've got obviously a, a lot of books there behind you over your shoulder. You obviously have read and studied a lot of books. Uh, you've got a lot of experiences yourself. How do you use this book? Is is this is this a uh, like a, a you know a periodic read every once in a while? Is this a reference book? Uh, is this a ma study manual? How do you use this book in in doing what you do? Okay, I never thought of it this way, but you just put a, a thought in my mind. Yeah, it's a reference book for a successful life. Right. And in and, and one way to put it. it, it's something that you pull precepts and concepts from constantly. I believe that we, as we sit here, are a summation of our life's experiences. Everything we've experienced up to the last breath that we just took. Right. The goods, the downs, the ups, the valleys and mountaintops, the vicissitudes of life that we go through. All of those experiences and everything that we've read, every syllable um, allows us to be who we've become, right? And at any given point, we'll pull from each of those perspectives, each of those experiences, and each syllable and word of every book that we've read. So you read the book and you find yourself constantly pulling upon it, right? And you realize, man, where did I get that from? Oh, that's, that's, I got that from Napoleon Hill. The imagination is one of those, right? Imagination, right? You know, there's nothing new under the sun. That's what, Everyone uh, has, has heard all their life. There's nothing new under the sun, but there are ways to use leverage and create with that those things that aren't new. And, and, and the marketplace is always gravitating towards new and better. Imagination is so important. I know um, definiteness of purpose will keep you focused. I love our, our brother Les Brown said years ago, man, it's been 30 something years since I heard this. He says, alarm clocks, you shouldn't need them. Purpose ought to get you up in the morning, right? And, and in pursuit of it, right? You know, the, the, I, the, the, my good friend, uh, the Apostle Paul says, you know, I press towards the mark of the high calling, implying, Galen, that there is a lesser calling. Let's say the, if, if the higher calling is perfection, I wake up every morning in pursuit of perfection knowing that I won't achieve it on this day, but in my pursuit of it, when I lay my head down on my pillow, I'll be closer to it than when I uh, woke up the morning, that morning before. So, so whatever your definite purpose is, you pursue it with a passion. Your passion energizes you. It actually gives you the energy to get up in the morning when you don't want to. 
everybody gets up when they when they when they, it's a, it's a good day. The sun's out, the bird bluebirds are out, and everything. But what about on those rainy days? What about in the midst of a pandemic? What about when you just got laid off? Right, purpose will still get you up. Right, and so there's so many precepts and principles in the book um, that lay the foundation for a successful life. And as you mentioned before, I want to emphasize. Think and Grow Rich, the book by Napoleon Hill, is not just about money. It's about pursuing uh, your, your, your desires in finance, in your social, your community, with regards to uh, your personal health, with regards to your vocation, your, um, you know, your relationship with your, your, your spouse and your, your children, et cetera. There's just so many facets that can apply, and it all starts with a definite and a purpose, right? You get married, definite and purpose. I want this to be the best marriage anyone has ever seen. And you can apply the precepts in Think and Grow Rich to help you get there. Wow, wow. So if you if you guys are just joining us, we are talking as we do every week, we're talking about the book, Think and Grow Rich. In particular, we're talking about the principle of organized planning, which is the sixth principle to riches. It is the um, the action that 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 turns desire into reality, and we are speaking with Wyman Winbush, the wisdom broker, and you see why he has been given that name and endorsed as the wisdom broker. And specifically, we've been talking about uh, leadership uh, because Napoleon Hill on page nine, page page one hundred nine. Uh, talks about the principles of effective leadership. And on page 112, he talks about the major causes of failure in leadership. And so that's what we're drawing from. And um, and, and that's what we're kind of leaning into. And I, I want to come back to you, Wyman, because it's, it's easy for uh, you and I to talk about our successes. It's easy for you and I to build a website o o about our successes. And um, man, I love your website. I'm pretty proud of mine. I've got all my successes up there. One of the things that we don't talk about a lot uh, are our failures. What are some failures that you may have had that um, as you look back, although that particular situation didn't work out the way, you, the way you had hoped, the learning from that situation has probably paid more dividends than, than anything you could have hoped for. Uh, are there any are there any failures that turned out to be life lessons for you? Every failure is a life lesson, Galen. Everyone. I mean, that's that's one of the things that I think is uh, uh, one of the keys to success. Look, uh, it, it, this may sound, you know, a little cliche is, but every situation you're in, good ones and bad ones are both a classroom and a lesson to be learned. Everyone we meet is both a potential student and a potential teacher. There is a lesson to be learned in every situation. Um, the pandemic taught us a lot about self-care. It taught us a lot about the need to be resilient. It taught us a lot about, yes, you, you're in the moment, but know that it is a moment. It's a point in time. It's not permanent. See, people get uh, find themselves in a state of despair when they find themselves in a valley experience. And instead of treating it as a moment in time, they treat it as, a, as if they're going to be frozen there. I'm not I'm going through the valley and I'm, I'm not pitching a tent there. I'm coming out. The sun's going to rise tomorrow. And when it rises, I'm going to be prepared to take advantage of the opportunities that take uh, that come with the new sunrise. If I focus so much on the valley, the dark time when the sun rises, the opportunities will be there, but I will not be prepared mentally or uh, equipped because I didn't uh, equip myself with new certifications, new uh, qualifications to take advantage of the opportunities. Watch this. A life seldom wastes success on the unprepared. Mm -hmm. Life doesn't waste success on the unprepared, right? And so we must uh, prepare ourselves and, and always remember failure is going to come. There's no one who's achieved greatness that did not fail. 
You look at the stories of Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Edison, uh, George Washington Carver. Uh, you look at just just go down the roll and their folks who, whose list of failures are probably longer than their list of success. But that's not what we know them for. We know them for the successes. Why? Because they were resilient. Why? Because they understood that moment of failure uh, is not permanent. It's a point in time. We will not be defined by our failures. We'll be defined by the number of times we got up off the ground after we failed. Right. And so that's an attitude that changes everything. I fail. Yes. It may have been embarrassing. Yes. Someone may have saw me. Yes. But you know what? The sun's rising tomorrow. And when the sun rises, they'll find me in the starting blocks once again, ready to take off and run this race until I win. Wow. Wow. I love it. I love it. You, you are reminding me of another story that I read somewhere read about somewhere and I can't even remember where I read this, uh, but it was a story about uh, a teacher and this teacher was doing like amazing things, miraculous things, people that things that people were like, how in the world is he doing it? And um, he asked one of his students, one of his followers to do one of those amazing things. Let, let's say to walk on water. He's like, you can you can walk on water too. Come on out here, you can walk on water. As long as the student was focused on the gold and focused on the, on, on the teacher, he was doing those amazing things. He was actually walking on water. As soon as he started looking at his surroundings, as soon as he started analyzing how this is actually impossible, as soon as he started focusing on how this can't be, he failed. He started to he started to fail. I don't know if you've ever heard that story before. I have heard that story, man. And you you're reminding all of us, all of us have the ability to get out the boat, mm. but you can't get out the boat playing it safe. You can't get out the boat, you know, being confined by, you know, what everyone says you can't do. Galen, one, one of the things, you know, I, I always encourage people is to remember the sky is not the limit. We've heard that all the sky is the limit. No, the sky is not the limit. Your mind is your limit. If you take the shackles off of your mind, you free up your potential to do things people have never even thought, right? Uh, thought about. That's where your imagination comes in. Uh, people, I refer to it as your moonshot. Galen, what's your moonshot? What does that mean? Back in the 60s, we had a president that challenged the United States of America to be the first to put a man on the moon. Unheard of, never been done before. But because he had the vision and he refused to be, uh, to, to water down or dumb down his, his uh, aspirations to fit the science of the day. Mm. We have one of the most iconic shots with the lunar module on the moon with the earth in the background. That photograph does not exist unless someone dared to use their imagination, dared to apply the precept principles of, of uh, definite of purpose as a leader, dared to lead and impart that passion for achieving that to others, whether they be scientists in NASA or uh, legislators in D.C. to fund it. You see all these principles come into play and I always ask people, what's your moonshot? And more importantly, what moonshot is still on the shelf because you're listening to people who say it cannot be done? Wow. You know, so, so there's got to be a sense of boldness. And that's where the definite of purpose, when you have that as a first principle, right? That means you cannot be talked down off of your dreams. Do not dumb down your dreams to make others, un, um, uh, to make others comfortable, right? Yeah, yeah, you know, think about this. We all have been called overachievers. Man, I, I love just sharing this with people. And, and if you realize, if you look back, the only people who call Galen an overachiever are people in Galen's life that aren't achieving as much as Galen. And the reason they call you an overachiever is because it's easier to call you an overachiever, a freak of nature, you're the oddity, than it is for them to step up their game and meet you where you are. Ah. <sighs> Man, I love it. I love it. And so does the chat. The chat is uh, is absolutely on fire. Imelda Wallace says she loves the show. Uh, Doretha Dennis is just giving you amen. And she's calling out 
we're not supposed to be talking about the Bible, man. This is not a Bible show, but she's calling out the fact that uh, Bible principles, biblical principles are taking shape. And um, and Melda Wallace, back to my mind is my limit. Um, uh, Renetta Gordon, uh, we are defined by our failures. Love it, love it, love it. Uh, and uh, let's see, okay, okay, we got we got Ms. Ms. Winbush talking about what's your moonshot? Do something you or even others haven't done before. Be a pioneer. Jason Murray is loving the insights. You know, one of the uh, one of the uh, other principles, one of the other books uh, that I keep thinking about when I was listening to you just now, Wyman, is uh, one of one of my longtime favorite books uh, by Carter G. Woodson, "The Miseducation of the Negro," and he said uh, he said a lot of great things in that book, but the one uh, section that I remember is he said that when you can control what a man thinks you don't have to worry about what he what he does if you tell him that his rightful place is to enter to the through the back door even if you don't provide a back door for him he will build one for himself and so this book this book thinking or rich is about how do you break out of this this limiting thought pattern that you have oh, gosh you thinking for yourself how do you decide what it is that you want to do and then build a plan around doing it for yourself rather than uh letting someone else control what you think which automatically puts limits uh, on your on your ability wow galen do we have another hour <laughs> first of all carter g woodson is absolutely right as a man thinketh so is he. I'm in the book, both in Think and Grow Rich and the B-I-B-L-E. As a man thinketh, so is he. So he was absolutely right. You know the old adage about the elephant. They put a little uh, a, a, a rope around the elephant when it's young, they put a stake in the ground, right? And it can't get away. As it grows to a several tons, it can easily break away, but its mind is tied to its initial experience and until it breaks away, the shackles not holding it down with a stake and tied to its leg, but the shackles on their mind. Mm. And that's what Carter G. Woodson was trying to say. And that's also why in the book, Think and Grow Rich, affirmations are so important. Every morning, you should be making statements, decreeing and declaring, releasing into the atmosphere who you are. Your words are important. Galen, you may have been in this mastermind, but a young man was uh, in, in uh, New York an aspiring speaker. And we asked him to introduce himself. And he said, hey, you know, um, I want to be a, a, a speaker, but right now I'm just driving a bus in, in the, for the New York City Transit. And I said, hold on. You know, again, you know me, you see me before. I said, hold on. You know, you said that wrong. How you should state that is I'm a great speaker that happens to be driving a bus right now. He said the same thing but he said it without the limitations associated with it, right? Limiting beliefs. It goes to anyone who's studied coaching and Galen, I knew you were a certified coach on several levels, right? We quickly identify limiting beliefs because limiting beliefs become limiting uh, words, uh, uh, aspirations, right? For example, uh, I'm never going to get ahead on these bills. We're always the uh, uh, last hired in the first. Those are negative aspirations and limiting beliefs that will shape your life going forward. So one of the things the book teaches us is how to release positive affirmations that speak well of ourselves. If you're raising children, you've been telling your daughter from early on that she is awesome, she's a success, she's gonna be a leader, et cetera. And they receive those, they receive those positive affirmations. It, it, it transforms the way they think of themselves and their lives are, will reflect that. We have to think well of ourselves and expect the best in order to be the best. Yes. And the Napoleon, Pil, uh, Napoleon Hill says in his book, um, until you can see it in your mind, you'll never see it in your hand. Mm. Right. And so those beliefs are so, so, so important. 
Yes. Oh my gosh. And organized planning is how you make that a reality. That's how you see it, right? That's how you identify those things that you're going to need, start securing those resources so that you can get from where you are to where you want to be. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to put you to work, uh, Wyman, because it, you and I, we, we knew each other uh, virtually for a while. Uh, one of the first times that we actually got to meet each other in person, certainly the first time we were asked to speak on the same panel, uh, was at the uh, International Mastermind Think and Grow Rich annual meeting. So I want, I want you to talk a little bit about your experience at the annual meeting, because we've got that annual meeting coming up again in uh, January uh, of uh, 2023 in Boca Raton, Florida. Uh, this is a place where uh, you get around like-minded people uh, who will speak life and challenge your life that you have to bring in writing. So you have to put your life in writing, uh, at least talking about what you've done over the previous year, and then your goals for the upcoming year and the plans, the organized plans that you have in place to make that um, that goal a reality. Uh, and if you don't have your life in writing when you show up, uh, you'll get an opportunity outside the door to put that life in writing so that you can come in the door. Talk a little bit about your experience uh, at the annual meeting because you, you've been a couple of times. Yeah, actually, um, you know, I was in sales for 31 years at IBM. And if you're in commission sales, you have something called a cadence call. And that's when you go to your manager and your manager looks at what you committed to the business and they look at what you're delivering. You know, do, you, do your intentions match your results? And it's an accounting. Well, this this annual meeting is an accounting for your life. It's a cadence call for your life. That's the way I put it in perspective. You're going to be held accountable. All the things that you said you wanted to become, wanted to do, how have you done? And you're held accountable for it. And, you know, the, the, the master uh, coach, right, the, 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 uh, the sales manager, if you would, I will put Ann in that role. Right. And so she's going to make sure you're held accountable. And, and that's so important because I always tell people, Galen, you'll appreciate this. A lot of people who say they want a coach really want a cheerleader. Ooh, ooh. And, right, right. And so a cheerleader will make you feel good about mediocre or suboptimum performance. When you come to this or this this mastermind uh, gathering, you're not there to have people make you feel good about marginal performance. You're there because you want to be held accountable. You're there with a bunch of folks of like mind. In other words, they're not competing with you. Everybody celebrates each other's successes. Everyone contributes to your success going forward. Imagine, remember I said, if you want to go far, take the village with you. This is the village. I don't care how competent you are, how focused you are, your one mind can not come close to providing the value that a room full or a conference full of folks can on your behalf. And that's what this uh, uh, gathering, annual gathering does for you. Holds you accountable, gives you ideas on how you become can become more successful. As a collective, they celebrate your success and help you figure out if you stumbled or fell uh, or wasn't able to accomplish something, they put the collective minds together to figure out how they can help you get where you want to go. It's just a wonderful experience, unique to this particular gathering, I might add. Wow, this is this is a, a, an amazing conversation, man. And to your point, we, we need another hour. We need to make this thing happen for another hour. Uh, I, I just would love to circle back to you and just get you know, what are your what are your final thoughts or key insights from this conversation? And then how can people get a hold of you if they want to get some of this wisdom for either themselves uh, or for their uh, small group or for their larger uh, organization? How can they get this wisdom for themselves? Well, uh, first, I'll, I'll give my uh, just final thought and then the contact information. Yes. Right. So my, my final thought is this. You know, I talked about pressing towards the higher mark, right? The higher column. It implies there's a lesser column. My final thought in, in encouragement, exhortation, don't settle for less when greater is available. Don't settle for less than when greater than is available. The question people often ask in America is, can I retire wealthy? 
And the answer is not, can you? The question is, are you willing to? Are you willing to do what's necessary to be wealthy? Are you willing to do what's necessary to achieve the higher? Or are you gonna settle for the lesser? That's a question you have to answer for yourself. And I encourage you, if, if, if greater is available, pursue it with all due diligence and speed. As, as the scriptures say, you know, grandma used to say, I came while I could. The day's coming when we can no longer pursue it. We have to take what we've got. So work while you can, work while the sun's up because it's gonna set at some point, right? How do you get a hold of me? Uh, Wyman Winbush, uh, WymanWinbush.com is, is my um, uh, website. Uh, Rosemary and I also have a, a company, uh, WRW, Wyman and Rosemary Winbush, right? WRW International LLC.com. You can find me on Twitter at uh, W Winbush. You can also find me on LinkedIn under my name. So those are the ways to get in contact with me. I'd love to hear from you. If you think we can, uh, Rosemary and I and uh, WRW International, or I can be of assistance to you, we would love to do just that. We're waiting to hear from you. Ah, man, this has been a fantastic conversation. It will absolutely not be the last. Uh, this has been a, just a great reminder of some core life principles. And the chat has absolutely shown that. Ren Renetta Gordon is, is, uh, is focused on break the shackles in your mind, which you talked about um, so much. Uh, this has been a limitless, uh, a, 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 a freeing conversation, and it's all tied to this book, Thinking Grow Rich, specifically the chapter and the principle of organized planning. My name is Galen Bingham. I'm the leadership strategist. There are so many ways you can get a hold of me on any social media platform, but the fun way, the most fun way is to check out my podcast, Whiskey, Jazz, and Leadership. We're on every podcast platform. Uh, we're also on Amazon. We're also on Audible. Uh, if if you don't, if you can't find my podcast, then you really don't want to check out the podcast because it's pretty easy. And actually, one of my guests from season one is Mr. Wyman Winbush. So definitely check out that conversation. I'm going to see if I can, if I can somehow tie tie him up and and bring him into uh, this next season to have another conversation on the podcast. Um, this has just really been liberating. Um, Jason Murray says, really appreciate today's session. Thank you. Uh, and that's what we do every Saturday morning at 8 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, we talk about a principle from this book, originally written in 1937 uh, by interviewing, Napoleon Hill interviewed 500 of the most successful people that he could find of his day people like Andrew Carnegie, people, uh, learning principles from uh, Henry Ford. Uh, you, you name the people uh, of that day. He interviewed 500 of them and tried to distill all of those success principles into these 13 principles that we talk about uh, with you every day. Uh, whether you like those people or not, <laughs> there's got to be something from their lives that's led them to being the kind of people that we talk about some 60, 70, almost 80 years later. So definitely check it out. You got Doretha talking about hurry back uh, because the wisdom you drop is off the chain, man. So uh, thank you, Wyman. Uh, Winbush, uh, much success, much continued success to you and your family and your bride in particular. Um, I, I just, I, I can't say enough about how much you are impacting the people that you come in contact with and anyone who wants to do well, uh, I want to help them do well. Um, so that is it. want to send traveling grace to Miss Ann McNeil who is um, uh, probably not going to let me have this show to myself, so she's going to be back here shortly. <laughs> uh, Dr. Peter James, uh, again, out doing great things in the world. Uh, we, we, we miss both of you guys. Uh, next week is going to be a master class conversation where we are going to close out this conversation on organized planning uh, and just encourage you to invite some friends, subscribe to the YouTube channel, uh, we're trying to get over 100 subscriptions uh, here before the end of the month. Uh, so you can play a role in that. Uh, ask your friends to subscribe 
to hit that bell so that they can be uh, aware of when uh, we come on with another great conversation like the one you've heard today, uh, and then be with us every Saturday morning at 8 a.m. This is Galen Bingham, the Leadership Strategist, uh, wishing you well and hoping that you will think and grow rich. Take care.